So I'm going to give you three things that we're going to pray for. Number one, we're going to pray for a harvest of harvesters. A harvest of harvesters. Remember, I'm talking about you. Look at your neighbor and say, she's talking about you. <laughs> Luke chapter 10, verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest field. And Acts chapter 6, verse 7 says, and the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now listen, we, there is such a rich history of revival, such a rich history of awakenings even. You say, what's the difference between a revival and awakening? We all kind of have a concept of what a revival is. Years ago, the Lord said it to me this way. He said, an awakening is an epidemic revival. What does that mean? It means you catch it yourself, and then everybody around you catches it too. Dylan's got revival all over her. Wave everybody. She's got revival all over her. She was part of leading hundreds and hundreds, thousands to the Lord. This and him too, yes. And the boyfriend too, can't remember your name. What is it? Ethan. Ethan and Dylan led like thousands of kids to, uh, to the life-saving relationship with Jesus Christ this, this summer. Can we give them a hand? Amen. Come on. You get revival, then everybody you get around gets sparks of that same fire, that same revival, and they start spreading it, and they start spreading it, and they start spreading it. How many want to be a spark of revival? Come on, back in the UK, back in the 1700s, there was a guy named John Wesley. And at that time, the church was so liturgical, so dry. It was doctrinally sound, but so dry, no life, no spirit. And John Wesley used to go out into the, into the soggy London or British countryside and it'd be pouring rain and the wind would be blowing and it would be wet and cold and he would stand out there with no amplification stand up on a stump and start preaching the gospel and 20,000 people came out to hear him preach the gospel and someone once asked him they said how is it that you get people to come out and stand in the rain and listen to you preach and John Wesley said this. He said, that's easy. I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. Come on, are there any burning ones in here today? Are there any burning ones that say, I want God to light me on fire with his love, light me on fire with his power, light me on fire so that I can be one that carries revival wherever I go. Come on, revival isn't a tent. It's not a building. You are revival. You carry revival with you everywhere you go. We got to get that mentality. You say, oh, that's just not my personality. God didn't say, these signs will follow those that have the right personality. <laughs> so many revivals that we could talk about and that we have talked about. But I want to tell you what's happened over the last 12 to 18 months. How many remember George Floyd that died that tragic death in Minneapolis? A new friend of ours, Joshua Giles, young African-American man, probably 30. And he was pastor a successful church in North Carolina, and several years ago, the Lord said, I want you to lay down this church, pass it on to somebody else, and I want to move you to Minneapolis. He said, Lord, do you know how cold it is in Minneapolis? Okay? He says, I'm a boy from the south, but yet the Lord moved him to Minneapolis. He started kind of a, a core leadership team, was looking at planting a church, still couldn't really figure out why God took him there. Until last summer, when George Floyd died on that street, a matter of two or three blocks from his home. So you know what Joshua Giles did with some of the other people that were part of his team? He went down to the very spot that George Floyd died and would go out there day after day and preach the gospel. He'd start ministering to the crowds because crowds of people were coming. And he'd start preaching the gospel. He'd start moving in the gifts. He'd start prophesying over Muslims. He'd start sharing words of knowledge with people in the crowd and they would fall to their knees and start weeping and crying and giving their hearts to Jesus so much that they actually had to bring a baptismal tank and put a baptismal tank right on the same street corner that George Floyd died at and the, and, and for weeks and weeks after that they were baptizing people into the kingdom on the same place that that man lost his life 
when all the California churches shut down last year, a young lady named Jesse Green, 30 years old or so, Jesse Green decided we're going to take our worship band out to the beach at Huntington Beach, and we're going to set it up out there. They say we can't meet in our churches, so let's go out and let's do worship on the beach. And unsaved and saved alike flooded Huntington Beach and started hearing not just worship, but they started hearing the gospel preached. And they would give an altar call and get them saved. And then as soon as they got saved, they'd take them straight into that cold Pacific water and baptize them into their new relationship with Jesus. Amen? Last year, there was a, a, a bar in New Orleans. Yes, I'm going to talk about a bar on Bourbon Street. It's called Sinners and Saints. Year before last, the owner of the bar was in a mess in his life. In a mess. And he kind of went away just to kind of think about his future. And while he was thinking about his future, he had an encounter with Jesus. And gave his heart to Jesus out of that encounter. After he encountered Jesus, he decided, well, I'm a Christian now. I better go sell my bar on Bourbon Street. And Jesus said to him, no, son, I have need of your bar. So all the religious spirits just leave, okay? <laughs> No, son, I have need of your bar. And so he started bringing in a worship leader, Chris Burns. And they would do worship sets night after night right down on Bourbon Street in a bar called Sinners and Saints. And people would flock in, hundreds of people would flock in to the sounds that were coming out of that bar. And when they got in there, they heard the gospel preached. And they were giving their hearts to Jesus in a bar on Bourbon Street. Even last year during shutdown, there was uh, hundreds and hundreds of people that gave their hearts to Jesus. By the way, they have a whole baptismal tank right in the bar. They don't get them, let them just give a, give a sinner's prayer. No, they take them straight up the steps and dunk them in the baptism tank, and they're born again to new life. Come on, guys. The, the new revival that God is bringing is not going to look like anything from a past season. It's a brand new time. It's out of the box. But God is looking for those that will be harvesters. God is looking for those that will bring revival on their jobs or in their schools. I'm actually the product. Come on, my husband's, my husband's shouting me down. I'm the product of uh, some young, young people back in the 1970s that got together their first day of high school in a janitor's closet, three of them. And they prayed that God would save their school. It wasn't my school, but I was affected by the revival that broke out there. Three of them in a janitor's closet. When they graduated, 92% of their graduating class was born again and spirit-filled. Come on, if God did it then, he can do it again. I said, if God did it then, God can do it again. If he did it there, he can do it here. Amen? He's just looking for some people that would be willing to be harvesters. Amen? So we're going to pray for harvesters. Number two, we're going to pray for a harvest of miracles. Because Paul said it this way. He said, I don't come to you preaching with persuasive words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Power doesn't come from the pulpit, guys. Power comes from the Holy Ghost that is resident inside of every single one of you. When you receive the Holy Ghost, that's the dunamis power of God. One of the definitions of the word dunamis is miracle working power. Put your hand on your belly and say, I've got miracle working power inside of me. Some of y'all didn't sound very convinced. Let's try it again. I've got miracle working power inside of me. Amen. Look at what it says. It says, and they overcame by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and loved not their lives unto the death. In Hebrew, the word testimony means do it again. It means repeat it, duplicate it, do it again. So when God does something for us, how many has God done something for you? Has done something for you has it has set you free healed you given you a new life given you a new start given you vision given you hope come on because we're partakers then we begin to testify and say this is what Jesus has done and whenever we testify see the Hebrews believed that when you gave a testimony it opened up the heavens so that God could come down and do it again 
Do you understand that that's what the thinking is behind the feast? Let's keep it then so that God can do it again. Let's keep telling the stories. Let's keep talking about the things that God's done in the past. But let me just say, we're not, to get to our future, we're not going to the past, but we're going to use the past to pull it into our future to begin to release us into a whole new day. We've got to get a harvest mentality. We've got to understand that God wants to use us to do miracles. God wants to do miracles for us, but he also wants to do miracles through us. And one of the ways that happens is by giving a testimony.